We are live, live, live. This is John Pounders with Now You See TV. I've got my co-host, John Hall, in the building. What's up, John? What's up, big John Pounders? How are you tonight, man? Doing great, man. Doing fantastic. This is an exciting show. Uh, for those of you that did not get a chance to listen to our show with Matthew on um, on True Frequency Radio, this will be a treat for you guys. Interesting story. Matthew has been a victim of MK Ultra for many years now, still a victim, um, has got a story to tell about it. And we also have David Carrico on tonight, which all of you guys are familiar with. What's up, David? How are you doing tonight? Hey, just fine, John. Just fine, that's all? Yeah, well, just <laughs> fine. Hey. Uh, what, is that your first, first cup of coffee or what, David? Right, yes, my first cup of coffee. <laughs> and also, Donna's here on the mic tonight. Hello. Uh, Donna, you're going to have to move your lips when Donna talks, so we... Yeah, I, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I am really glad and excited to be on tonight. Uh, I really appreciate Matthew and his testimony. And uh, I'm just real thankful to be along for the ride tonight and uh, really appreciate this material being made public. All right. So for those of you that are tuning in on YouTube and you would like to join us in our Now You See TV chat, uh, feel free to do so. You can click on the link in the YouTube video and it'll take you to our private chat here on Now You See TV where you'll be able to ask our guests questions or ask us questions at near the end of the show. And uh, you'll also, this is a moderated chat over here. So um, we don't we don't give timeouts or anything like that over here. YouTube, I think they might give you a timeout first to warn you, but we do have moderators over in YouTube as well. And I want to thank you guys that are over there. I know Brent's over there. I'm not sure who else is over there yet, but um, usually Kevin and Samuel are over there as well. So thank you guys for doing that over there. And so tonight with, we're going to get this, get this show going because uh, Matthew has a big story to tell. Uh, he also has a book that you guys can get a hold of. And I'll let him explain a little bit about that. Uh, and, but basically we'll start this whole thing off and I want to, I want to get you guys to kind of hear how he got started in this. So Matthew, tell us a little bit about your beginning in all of this. I know last time we had talked, you had talked about your incident at your workplace. So start there and let's just keep going and, and keep rolling until, uh, until you don't want to go anymore. We can stop you anywhere here through here. Tonight's more laid back than TFR. We don't have commercial breaks and uh, we just like to have a good time on the show. I always tell people on the show, we're not the most professional. We don't try to be, uh, but we do have uh, the best guests and I believe we have we cover a, such a wide variety of content on this channel that uh, it's just amazing. So just feel free, have fun, and this is a family environment. Most of the people that listen here are, are listeners that listen every time. So, so welcome, Matt. Yes. Well, thank you very much, John. I, I really appreciate, first of all, that you've uh, now this is your second interview of me, and and I really really appreciate you uh, inviting me on here, and uh, it's really a makes me and my wife uh, safer to have these interviews uh, go on uh, because uh, as you'll discover in the story and listeners will discover there's been a lot of uh, danger uh, being a whistleblower of MK Ultra. Uh, in terms of where it started, um, back in 2005 uh, in August that year in Toronto there was a plane crash on August 2nd and I was actually working just across from the airport as a computer programmer and I happened to be at the fourth floor window which was the highest uh, and you can go because of the inverted cone near the, the airport where they can't build the buildings high. So we had a perfect bird's eye view of this uh, plane crash and it, it overshot, just landed past halfway, but it didn't land. It just kept going off the end of the runway, knocked over a few light stands, descended into a gully, and then within 30 seconds, white smoke started billowing out. And after that, it was black smoke uh, for the rest of the afternoon and, it, and the plane burned to the ground. So what happens uh, to people <laughs> happened to me and a few other people, I think, uh, is that when you see what looks like hundreds of people dying in front of you, you can have what's called a post-traumatic stress event uh, where you actually, uh, something happens in the mind and you dis dissociate for that period of time because it's just too traumatic. And that's what happened to me. I flew, I fled through a stairwell from the fourth floor, a cement stairwell, and by the time I came out of that stairwell, I knew I was a different person because I had imagined the deaths and, and the faces of all of these people burning up and it was just a horrible vision. 
And so when I came out of that stairwell, I was quite uh, affected. And within six to 18 hours, I had no memory of the plane crash, uh, which was a pretty strange thing. Uh, and people afterwards were asking me if I saw the plane crash, and I, I said, no, I didn't see it because I, I didn't remember anything. Then on August 19th, two and a half weeks later, on 2005, uh, in Toronto, we had a tornado evacuation because a, a tornado touched down in Fergus, Ontario. And again, it was one of these traumatic things where uh, they tried to evacuate just our team from the building, and I started arguing with the team leader and saying, look, if we're facing a natural disaster, we should be, you know, in fact, evacuating everybody, not just our team. And then he said, no, we've talked to that, those other teams already. Look, just our team's evacuating. And if you don't you know, like it, you're staying here. You understand you're staying here. Just say that you understand that you're on your own. I said, okay, fine, I'm on my own. So me and another guy felt sort of pressured into staying, and we both stayed. And unfortunately, it was a very bad situation. We were the only uh, people on the northwest corner of that building, uh, and that's where the, the tornado came in, and it started uh, obliterating the windows with debris and finally uh, actual, it sounded like gunshots as high speed, high velocity uh, hailstones and, and actual rocks were hitting the windows. And we both went under our desks immediately because it sounded like the windows were gonna break. And that's, that's curtains when that happens in a tornado. And I went into shock within about 15 minutes. And once I was in shock, I, I was in bad shape. And within about 45 minutes, someone tried to rescue me, uh, a gentleman who was uh, really a hero and in, in so doing, he tried to bring me out of the building through the same stairwell I had fled after seeing the plane crash. And I was in shock at this point, and that stairwell equaled death in my mind. So I immediately ran back to my desk and said, no, I can't go there. The second time, he got more organized and had his daughter, who works in an office beside the CEO on the uh, lower floor. It's interesting, the building's near the airport, the management is in the lower floors. <laughs> anyway. Uh, when she was fetched, she held the door open. He tried to force me through with his arm around me and, and literally forcing me through. And I just snapped because I, I mean, I was in such bad shock that I had one pupil uh, largely dilated and the other one pinned really small. And uh, I grabbed him by the lapels and I threw him, and, which is a terribly violent, terrible thing to do. And I you know, feel terrible about it. Uh, but in my oxygen deprived mind, he was trying to kill me because that stairwell equaled death in my oxygen deprived mind. Anyway, so he landed on the, the third stair. He grabbed the railing and just sprained his arm, but other than that, he was okay. And he then took control of the situation and, and proceeded to talk me down and then eventually uh, get some help from me. From the, My 13-person team from the basement came up. Uh, they were all Chinese, and they know this rapid hand massage that got me partially out of shock. And because I had been violent, he decided that I should be interrogated. And so he got his 200-pound nephew to come to work immediately. And he took me to an un, un, unoccupied floor, to a darkened room, sat behind me with his uh, nephew, and started asking me questions. Have you ever thought of harming yourself or harming other people? Now, at this point, I was partially out of shock, but still partially in shock. And I was thinking, well, I've just been violent. I'm going to be charged with assault, and I'm going to lose my career. Because as a computer programmer, you have to work in highly secure environments. You can't have a criminal record. So I thought, well, I've got to give him something. In my sort of oxygen-deprived mind, I decided that, I should sort of exaggerate and confabulate a discussion I've had 10 years earlier, 1995, regarding a neoconservative politician whose actions resulted in the deaths of over a dozen people. And so I decided that I would exaggerate this discussion I had with my friend and make it sound like we were planning evil things back then, which we were not, but in my oxygen-deprived mind, that's what I thought I should do, which turned out to be a big mistake. And that was when I was, the right there is when I was tagged as a potential terrorist. And that was August uh, 19th, and then um, I started noticing I was being surveyed. There was people in cars, uh, well-dressed, uh, well-groomed men uh, sitting in cars watching my house. Uh, then I, I got a phone call from him in October, and it went something like this. Uh, hi, Matthew. And I said, you know, hi, Gary, how are you doing? And he said, well, listen, Matthew, have, have you been interrogated yet? And I said, interrogated? By whom? And he said, the authorities. And I said, uh, no. He said, oh, those guys, uh, talk to you later, Matthew, click. And then I knew something was going to happen, something bad was going to happen. And sure enough, about three weeks later, the, later in October, towards the end of October, a gas company inspector came to my house. And he decided that I should uh, get this free energy conservation program, and he would need to get access to my furnace room. And I fell for it. 
And so I let him in. And while he was in my furnace room, he asked me to turn the hot water on uh, at a bathtub upstairs. And when I said to him, well, there's a bathtub down here, because we have a fully finished basement, as you can see behind me. He was very disappointed. He said, oh, you have a bathtub down here, a bathroom down here? He was like, and right away my antenna went up. Uh-oh, why does this guy want to be alone in my furnace room? So I, I played along, and I turned the hot water on for two or three minutes. I came to the furnace room, and he was all finished, and he was acting kind of furtive and anxious. And he took me upstairs, and he had me sign an invoice for zero dollars with white, yellow, and pink copies, or white, yellow, and green, actually. And... I just had to put my big signature, which was later later used, uh, as I'll explain. And uh, that's when I knew that something was really bad was going to happen because I found out on a, on a website that that's what the authorities do when they want to get access to your house and do a search and they don't have probable cause. And sure enough, when he left, he didn't stop at any other neighbor's houses. He just got in the van and drove away. And then this is everything up until November 22nd when the big event happened in 2005 which was a cold night. I mean, it's up in Canada here. It was cold. I was walking north just a few blocks from my house towards my house on Young Street, which is the center of Toronto, Canada's largest city, when I was approached by a guy that was five foot 11, uh, short blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, and a slim build and a slightly long chin. And he was standing beside a six foot three, 230 pound, uh, very large guy uh, with bushy black mustache and a bushy black hair that was medium length and he was an RCMP officer <laughs> as I later found out uh, which is our Royal Canadian Mounted Police our paramilitary so and the guy on the on the, the first guy was actually a joint task force which is part of the US military who run Guantanamo Bay and uh, as they, they said look Mr. Uh, are you uh, Matthew Pauly and, and they said well, look we just uh, have a question for you why is it that you have uh, three balls of hydrogen peroxide in your basement in your furnace room. And I was really, really surprised. By the way, my screen went blank. Um, anyway, you still see me? Yeah, we're still here. I just turned off my camera for a second because I was going to get up. You are, oh. You're still um, still loud and clear, though. Okay. Um, so uh, when, um, when I saw that they, you know, they were very serious and they had this question, I answered them truthfully, which is, well, yes, I do have three balls of hydrogen peroxide in my furnace room. And the reason is uh, I was using them as a disinfectant for growing a certain fungus, which Central American Indians have found helps migraine headaches. And my wife suffers from debilitating migraine headaches and big uh, pharma solutions aren't working for her. So that's what I did. And they said, well, okay, that's interesting. Listen, we just have a few more questions. Uh, we have a van just a block away. It's pretty cold outside. Why don't you just come with us for a few minutes? And we'll just, just get this over with. And I thought, well, okay, you know, I know what's happened. There's a misunderstanding based on that interrogation at work. I'll just straighten it out with these guys. Everything will be fine. And they marched me through uh, Postal Station K uh, parking lot with the postal vans all the way back going down this parking lot. And it was all darkened. Normally, there's three sodium vapor lights, but it was all dark that night. And I stopped about halfway through because they had told me to march in front of them. And I was feeling not comfortable and I didn't want to be compliant I stopped and the big guy yelled at me keep walking really loud and which frightened me and so I decided to keep walking and then on the other side of that parking lot there was this big five-ton monocolored military armored van and I only found out later it was military um, I didn't know at the time and so they, there was a guy on each side of the van and a guy behind on the other side of the van and two guys behind me so I was literally surrounded uh, by special forces and so I decided to comply and they opened the door in the back which said and the guy leaned out and said Matthew you know come on in so I, I got in the van and uh, my life changed uh, forever after what happened in that van maybe I'll just take a little moment here and have any questions so far I got one for you mm -hmm. um, have you uh, had this happen to you and you just didn't have any warning at all? Well, I mean, yeah, there was no official warning, but I mean, I'm a, I'm a reasonably smart guy and I could see the escalating pattern of surveillance uh, starting from the guy, for the, the guys watching me in the cars, uh, so the call from Terry asking if I'd been interrogated, then the gas company guy, which turned out was not a gas company guy. 
Uh, and then, uh, you know, I could see the escalating pattern of surveillance. So I knew that this was something was going to happen, but I didn't know what exactly. Matthew, do you think this was random that you just kind of fell into their wheelhouse or do you think you were chosen for some reason? Oh, I think I was chosen. Uh, and it, it, and the two reasons I were chosen were during that interrogation in the workplace, in addition to me, you know, laying a slightly false trail uh, about confabulating and exaggerating a discussion that I'd had in 10 years earlier, I also was asked about my childhood stuff. And I meant, well, what happened was, as I was in deep shock in that stairwell and I, and I was like, I was going to die. I mean, it was really serious. I suddenly remembered something from about 30 years earlier when I was eight years old and where I had been exposed, <clears throat> exposed to a serial killer and uh, who, uh, in addition to sexually assaulting me to shut me up, he dug up a dead body uh, in, in the forest in rural British Columbia, a recently deceased young lady uh, who was naked in an unmarked grave and sat her up and pointed to her and maybe pushed me in front of her and said, this is what's going to happen to you and your mother if you tell anybody. And when I related that story to Terry, he immediately asked details. I gave him the dates. I gave him the names. I gave him the postal codes. And I said, you know, yes, tell the RCMP. And because, you know, something's got to be done to stop this person. And um, when I did that, uh, it established that I'd suffered from severe psychological traumas as a child. Now, it turns out that this training exercise in this van, which was documented on the Department of National Defense up in Canada website in 2006, it was documented uh, in 2005 as being Joint Control Unified Command. And this was between JTF and JTF-2, which is the Canadian Special Forces. And the JTF guy was teaching the JTF-2 guy how to do coercive interrogation, or what's called enhanced interrogation techniques, which is a nice way of saying torture. And the second part of that interrogation exercise part was actually something which did not appear in the DND description. The second half was mind control. That is torture until a person dissociates, that is their, their mind splits, they become very passive, and they're almost, uh, they can die in shock in that state. Uh, and then they're hypnotized and forced to repeat post-hypnotic suggestions to be triggered in the future, once they're out of the trance, even months and even years later, to do a certain action given a certain trigger. And they need, for that purpose, people who've had a history of psychological traumas, a, a history of dissociation, because it turns out that dissociating the mind is like chopping a block of wood. You have a round of wood. The first time you chop it in half, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of strikes, even a wedge to, to chop it in half. But once you've got a half piece, and you go to chop that into quarters, it's much easier. Similarly, you take the quarter piece, you chop that into eighths, it's much easier. Well, it turns out splitting the mind, dissociation, is the same thing. So you don't want to be torturing a person for several hours to totally dissociate. It's hard on uh, the people in the van and the people around, right? The torturer doesn't care because he's a sadist. He gets a pleasure out of it. But the people in the van that are, that are being trained, you know, it's going to be hard on them. So they want to try and get someone who dissociates quickly. So what you need is someone who has a history of severe psychological traumas in their childhood. That means they're going to dissociate in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes of torture. Let's, let's take a quick step back real quick because there's a lot of people that are listening. Well, I don't know if there's a lot of people. A lot of our, most of our listeners are really educated into this stuff. But in case there's people jumping on right now that have no idea what MK Ultra is, can you give a brief history uh, before we further go further into the timeline of things? Agree, give a brief history on what MK Ultra is, how it started, and where it came from, because I think that's really important for people to understand if they don't know what we're talking about here. Absolutely, John. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, that's very appropriate. And first I'll say, first of all, in, in 1945, there was something called Operation Paperclip. And uh, during Operation Paperclip, this was a program to resettle about 8,750 Nazi scientists from Nazi Germany to America. About half of them were rocket scientists and were put to uh, NASA and the other half are mind control scientists. And the results were Dr. Joseph, Joseph Mengele's peers. Dr. Joseph Mengele was the most horrible angel of death, they called him. He was the most awful, horrific, sadist, and he did horrible, brutal experiments and murders of twin Jewish, Jewish children. And so these people, these scientists, were brought to America, and they were put in the CIA and in the military. 
for the very purpose of developing mind control. So shortly after they arrived in 1945, uh, they, we, we st they started a program called MK Ultra, and the MK is from the Latin Germanic phrase mental control. And ultra, of course, means really heavy duty. So this is like really heavy duty mind control. And this, there's, this is completely nefarious. There's no useful purpose for this, except to deceive citizens of your country and voters of your country by staging false flag events by mind controlled actors who have no memory of what they've done afterwards and can't finger the real doers. Anyway, so MKUltra, the program was formed by the CIA it ran from, uh, you know, 53 approximately through uh, late 60s or so argumentation going on, non-consensual, violated the Bill of Rights, violated, you know, United Nations charters and, and Geneva Conventions. So finally there was a congressional, actually it was a Senate inquiry in 1977. And at that inquiry they said, oh, the CIA said, we've stopped this, we're not doing this anymore. But we know that's false because a former deputy director, Victor Marchetti, said that that's a cover story. And furthermore, there's many people who can testify, including myself, that this program is ongoing. It's just gone covert since 1977. It's, it's black operations, which is more fun for them anyway. They get to practice their spy skills uh, at the same time as they're doing these horrible experiments on people. Uh, so the goals of the program are, one, to create a truth serum for, this is a legitimate idea, right, to interrogate spies. Uh, but really, uh, the, the, the real program is really about coercing people through an incapacitating agent, such as scopolamine, and using torture, trauma, and, and using hypnosis to do things against their will, their self-interest, and even their survival instinct, and have no memory about it afterwards. So you can make a person do something horribly against their willpower and their interests, such as go and shoot somebody, and then they have no memory about it afterwards, so they can't finger the real doers who made them do it. Um, can I a go ahead. Um, I just want to interject something. I, I've always thought that uh, all kinds of abuse have to do with uh, decreasing the population in a way can be controlled. So if you're dysfunctional and you um, are uh, disassociated or do disassociate, then a lot of times those people have trouble really being functional in our society. So I think it's another way to reduce the population that would have all their faculties, in other words. I think that might be part of the big goal of all this. What do you think? Um, well, I mean, it's, I mean, post, <clears throat> the result of dissociation uh, is that you have what's called, of course, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is an illness which can be cured, uh, given enough uh, therapy, enough uh, time, and enough supportive environment, and a safe environment, and the support of friends and family. So it's not like there's faculties missing, it's just the person is ill for a while. Um, I think it's more of an opportunistic thing that they choose these people because it makes it much, much easier to use them as mind control subjects because they can torture them for a much shorter period. Now in terms of the overall, the overall goal of taking this mind, these mind controlled slaves and doing false flag terror events, I think there is some tie in with the whole depopulation agenda. Because once you have coerced a population through terror events, to accept the Patriot Act, the National Defense Authorization Act, the Anti-Terrorist Act up in Canada here. People give away their rights and freedoms because they think that they need to do that to protect themselves from quote unquote the terrorists, which was actually a big false flag operation using MK Ultra Patsies, coordinated by intelligence agencies. Then you can do things like get away with uh, chemtrail spraying, which is definitely a depopulation agenda. Because people can't organize when they don't have privacy, they don't have the right of assembly, they don't have the rights to do a lot of things because they're being gang stalked, because they've been identified in, as a target, as a potential terrorist, because they happen to store food in their basement, or they happen to care about the environment and sign petitions. So, yes, I think that, you know, you can link it to the depopulation agenda. Uh, Matthew, do you believe that 
this uh, serial killer that you were exposed to as a young man, do you believe that he was a programmed assassin and that this was the moment when he exposed you to that trauma? Do you believe this was the moment when you were really chosen? Well, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it, it, you know, you could, you could say that in, in, in the context that once I was exposed to that level of uh, violence and that level of persecution, uh, that later in my life I was, I was a sitting duck to be chosen as uh, a candidate. Um, so that's definitely a possibility. But at the time, this person was a 17-year-old kid, and he had a father who was German, and uh, the, he had definitely been abused, I'm sure, from his father. And his father was in on this. And I'm sure if, if, if the father was the serial killer, or he was the serial killer, or both of them were serial killers. But they were definitely covering for each other, because after the event, literally that same day, after I went hysterical, uh, the guy grabbed his father and, and me and took me back to the site, and his father had buried the body and tried to give me this cover story about this religious beliefs, this is the way they bury their dead, and I'm not to tell the RCMP ever. And he made me promise, and he looked in my eyes, and they were very cold eyes, and I was all alone with these guys in the middle of the wilderness in the Kootenai Mountains in British Columbia. And he says, you've got to promise. And I knew if I didn't promise in that moment that I might die. So I promised. And it took 30 years for me to remember that. Uh, and later in life, I was a sitting duck to be chosen for this kind of experimentation as a result of the severe traumas that I, that I underwent. Yeah. Uh, do you think that um, events like Sandy Hook and the Colorado theater shooting that MK Ultra has anything to do with these type of events? Well, um, I would say 100% yes, uh, and specifically, I, can, I, I, I must confess that I haven't studied the Sandy Hook thing, but I know people that are good friends of mine, mine who have done the research and, and have confirmed that for Sandy Hook. I can tell you I've, I've done some research on James Holmes and the, and, and the Colorado uh, so-called Batman theater shooting, and absolutely 100%, it has all the indications. I mean, first of all, in the courtroom, his eyes are super dilated. And when you're on scopolamine, your eyes are super dilated. Okay. Second, he stayed at the scene in a park in his parked car at the theater, just like a good patsy would do. So I don't even think that he was that he was a patsy because there are actual witnesses in the theater who saw two men, and there was two gas masks found at the scene. Because you can't take somebody off the street and use the program them as an MK Ultra killer in in a matter of a month or two and get them to shoot up a bunch of people in a the theater. You need someone who's been, you know, from birth or from young childhood has been in the program. These are the so-called super soldiers. That's who are the real, you know, shooters of mass number of people. In fact, we saw three such uh, people present in San Bernardino. The people in the, in the medical center across the street from the shooting saw three men all dressed in black with bulletproof vests, AK-47s, balaclavas, and through the holes in the balaclavas, you could see they were Caucasian. And they were shooting, and people were falling. So these, this Muslim couple gets blamed for it, and they, sure, they drove away, and the police say that they shot at them. Maybe they did, but they weren't necessarily the killers at all. I don't believe that. And, but going back to James Holmes, uh, we also have some context here. James Holmes' father was a senior banking uh, expert and was about to testify in an investigation about corruption in the banking business. And what, what not a better way to stop him from doing that than putting his son as a patsy in a mass shooting. And furthermore, he was a normal, I mean, very successful guy doing research in mind psychiatric stuff. Uh, and then all of a sudden, his, he dyes his hair red and becomes kind of strange looking. And that's exactly a painting and a portrait of creating uh, uh, someone who's going to look like a believable uh, killer. So I, I think he's 100% innocent. Yeah. How many people would you say um, that the government would have at this time that they could access to do things like this? Do you think they would have? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I was asked this question before, and I did, uh, I did a, a quick uh, extrapolation, and it goes as follows. I know there's five in Toronto alone, just like presently in the last few years, minimum five. And that's the five that I know of. So if you extrapolate to those that I don't know of, 
but just being by one factor of 10. Okay, that's 50. All right, now that's in Canada's largest city, representing 12% of the population. So if you multiply that 50 by about 10, because of the, the whole population of Canada, you're into 500. Well, now in the United States, it's 10 times the population. So you're looking at about 5,000. And that's just present. What about the ones who were programmed 10 years ago? There's another 5,000, right? So you've probably got at least 10,000 in the United States, which is plenty, plenty. All you need is a handful to completely destabilize society through horrific terror events that appear to be the, you know, attributed to whatever the boogeyman ideology of the day is. Used to be Marxism, now it's Islam. So what do you think their, their end game is? What's their, where are they headed with all this? Well, um, again, this is uh, just conjecture. I don't know where, what their minds are, but I mean, I think there's a definite move towards uh, increasing the role of the United Nations as a world government and therefore bringing United Nations soldiers into America, sending the real military out of the country to fight wars and then potentially disarming the society and getting much more control over people. And this is part of a global agenda by the wealthiest of the wealthy, with the so-called 13 families, people like the Rockefellers, uh, the Rothschilds, who own all the world banks. All the national banks in the world are owned by that family. They're trillionaires. And they win. When they fund, they, this is the Napoleonic Wars. They've been found to be funding both sides of wars. And the reason they fund both sides is because the more damage and destruction to a country, the more money they're going to have to borrow from the central banks to reconstruct the country. When you've got this level of evil and malevolence going on at the world level, you can see the end game really is the intel agencies are being controlled by these higher powers. And they are looking to get more and more control over the, and create more servile population that is completely surveyed can't resist, almost like George Orwell's 1984. So we're basically, I guess, talking about the concept of the New World Order and of the Masonic Illuminous concept of order out of chaos. And yes. Matthew, I wondered, would you feel comfortable about talking about the Masonic oath you were asked to take under duress? Yeah. Um, before I get to that, I should just mention that my, uh, the person who's been working on me since 2005, he wants to go by the alias of Mitch. And he told me in a home invasion, of which I've had five since 2014, and he's always armed. He has at least two weapons on him, uh, an all-chromed uh, 38 and, and a black 9 millimeter. And he's put them to my head. And he's tortured me, etc. It's been really horrific. And not to mention assault, a very bad kind of assault. Um, this gentleman, I shouldn't say gentleman, this person uh, said to me that in my presentation at the University of Toronto, I must have a slide that shows the cover page of the 1977 Senate investigation into MK Ultra, Because on the cover page, down at the bottom, and he said it's really important, because he, he, he hit me like this, because I was saying that I had to cut the page off. And he said, no, I, said I can't help it. You know, the, the, this is a portrait page, and in PowerPoint slides, our landscape. He says, well, okay, fine. But you've got to show the symbol at the bottom. The symbol of, of the bottom is this eight arrows pointing outwards. It's the symbol of chaos. And that's on the cover page of the Senate investigation of MKUltra. Wow. And so that's pretty disturbing. Um, and in terms of what you're talking about, you brought up, uh, yes, it's true. In, in a home invasion, uh, this was in February of uh, 2016, uh, at my kitchen counter, we have a nice breakfast bar, and at that breakfast bar, he put this document out. He had just woken me up because he puts me to sleep with scopalamine, and then he wakes me up, he, he goes around my house and looks through all my books and all my belongings, and, and, and then he wakes, wakes me up and he says, Matthew, this document, you have to sign this. And this document, I, it just had two sentences. And one se it started off, I just read the first sentence, and it said, I pledge allegiance and my life to the Masonic order. And then it went on. And I didn't read the rest of it because I didn't want to know what it was. But I was under so much duress. I was torture, trauma, dissociated. I was blasted on scopalamine, which is an incapacitating agent. And I, I had no free will. And he said, this fountain pen, Matthew, I drew blood from you when you were asleep. And I've loaded it into this pen. And sure enough, when I signed it, it was red ink that looked like blood. And so he made me do that. 
which connects the U.S. military and the, I won't name them, the Civilian Intelligence Agency of the United States. It names, it connects them to the Masonic Order, that he made me do that. So you've been on Coast to Coast. I think you've been on Coast to Coast. Yes. John B. Wills, on with John on Truth Frequency Radio, and now on Now You See TV. Yes. Do you fear any repercussions or backlash from coming on and telling your story? Um, yes, there is repercussions and there is backlash, and I've been told that I'm no longer allowed to do this or they'll kill me. Uh, that was in the June 19th abduction that I was told that. But at the same time, I know that this is a way of saving my life, or at least giving me a little lease on life, because the higher profile I am in telling my story, uh, the more people that are going to notice when I am suddenly deceased from an accident uh, or uh, a, a sudden onset of cancer uh, or uh, my car suddenly has a terrible problem and I die in a terrible crash. Uh, or something as simple as I get stabbed or shot. You, you said that uh, he, it's a home invasion. Do you ever see it coming? Do you ever see him coming, or do you never see him oh, come into the once. house? Only once? Yeah, only once. And uh, I have increasingly increased the security of my house. I've gone through three burglar alarm systems in 2015 and, and, and into 2016. I spent over 10000 on security. I've hired security guards, including armed security guards, for up to a week at a time. But I can't stop this. I mean, these people are experts. This is what they do for a living as special forces and spies at doing covert black ops. But one time I was on my couch and he used a technology from outside. Okay, so I didn't know when he was even there. It's called Voice to Skull. And this was inv invented back in the 1970s. And all of a sudden I hear this voice and they do it's microwaves that are two microwave beams that come together right beside your ear and it stimulates the cochlea in your inner ear and you hear what they say into the microphone perfectly perfectly and so I hear this voice saying Matthew we know where you are you're on the couch stay there this is a black operation don't move and there was two guys banging at the back door and I, I put this big lock it was this um, uh, I, have, I have seven locks in the back door this is a u-shaped thing that with a cane like a rod and you wedge it underneath the doorknob and so it took two guys to kick the, the middle of the door and then kick the bottom of the door and the middle of the door the bottom of the door and they did it rapidly one after the other like this and gradually they inched it forward now in in those few seconds had i not been hypnotized by hearing his voice and he used a code word on me that made me to immediately fall into a trance and become passive if i had not been hypnotized by that voice to, to decay communication I probably could have reached the phone and dialed 911, but I couldn't. So they came in, and that was it. Incredible. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking of, you know, the bodyguards, the security, that you, that you have to seriously vet these people before you even um, allow them to, to guard you. I mean, if they're, they're, they are that good, you have to vet these people uh, seriously. You had mentioned uh, the serial killer when you were younger. Anything prior to that, uh, anything in your upbringing that you, that you remember that led you to that moment? Or yes. was it just a normal childhood? No, it wasn't. I mean, it was an idyllic childhood on one half because my father was a cultural anthropologist, very well educated, and very smart, and very concerned about helping the world and making the world a better place. And in a lot of ways, good father. In other aspects, not such a good father uh, from his own problems with his own father. And so he wasn't very... Uh, how should we say, warm and fuzzy and caring. Uh, on the other hand, my mother, it was a really bad situation with my mother. She was very ill, and she, I don't know exactly what her issues were, but uh, she was diagnosed with all sorts of illnesses, mental illnesses mostly. And she had co-custody, not co-custody, but she had us on the weekends and also in the summer breaks and the Christmas holidays for half of each. And the problem is every time she'd be with us, she'd be stressed from caring for two children and she'd inevitably lose it and she'd become like manic or psychotic and, and she'd try to kill herself or kill us and so there was some severe traumas. And uh, then uh, she ultimately was the one who took us to Argenta, BC in this Quaker community where this horrific abuse occurred. 
because she wasn't taking care of us and we were wandering through this mountain community of, of 500 people uh, with unaccompanied and we were prey for adults. And that's sort of what happens and how it happened to me. Matthew, I just want to say I am so thankful that you have had the courage to speak out about this. There's so many people that try, but to have a cognate story and to be able to put the parts together, I know you're a very unusual victim because we've talked to other victims and we know that this is not usually the case. So I am really thankful and proud that you've been able to articulate this so well. Thank you. Well, thank you. You know, uh, as I've said in my, I really appreciate that. I've, as, as I've said in my previous, previously that, you know, I was very affected by a book uh, by Dr. Or, well, I'm not sure if he's a doctor, but Victor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. So in my early 20s, I read this book in university, and it really changed me because he was a survivor of Auschwitz. And he noted that of the people that actually survived the camps, of course, which was an infinitesimally small number of people, uh, there were many people that had the same criterion but didn't survive. But uh, the ones that survived, he noticed they all had a profound meaning in life, a reason for living. They had a family that they loved, they wanted to be back to. They had a book they needed to write. They wanted to start, you know, a program or something. The point being that meaning in life is critical to being able to survive, uh, you know, really difficult circumstances. So when I realized that my childhood was really bad, uh, I decided that I needed to follow Viktor Frankl's advice. So I decided from that moment forward to dedicate myself to making the world a better place for not only this generation, but future generations. And so in a way, this horrific thing that's happened to me in my life has given me a chance to contribute to this world, which I probably wouldn't have had, had this not occurred. Uh, so in that sense, I'm grateful and I'm blessed that I was given the opportunity to make a difference. Uh, Matthew, do you have any idea why you're able to recall things so well, which is indeed unusual to most people that are subjected to this uh, MK Ultra? What, what do you think it is that you're able to do this? Right. Now, that's a good question. Uh, I just found out, and again, that was in the uh, January or the February home invasion. I believe it was the January one. Mitch said, Matthew, I need to know. What is it about your memory? How come you're able to recall dialogue so well? Is there anything you have any tests on every time that you have some special abilities? I said, no, I don't think so. And I thought, well, hold a sec. When I was about 11, I did this test, and it's where they read you a, a set of random words, and they see how many you can repeat back in perfectly in order. And the human average IQ uh, is about seven words. But I could do 11 words, which is over 50% more which means I'm somewhat of a savant for recalling dialogue. And you'll see that in my book, uh, The Murder of Time, Making and Unmasking a Sleeper by Matthew Polly. You'll note there's a lot of dialogue, and this is actually true dialogue. And Mitch said that he looked through all the MK Ultra files going back to the 1950s. Never has anybody been able to do what I did, which was I documented the dialogue going up until forced electric shock. And then right after the electric shock ceased and I regained consciousness, the dialogue picks up perfectly without a mistake. And no one has been able to do that. So, yeah, I do have some sort of special abilities for recalling things, uh, which, I mean, in a way makes me an ideal, uh, an ideal whistleblower. Um, and which, so I scratch my head, like, why wouldn't they kind of click onto this, that maybe it's a good idea to let me go. Like, don't harass me anymore. Don't do this to me anymore. But... I don't know why. I have a favorite verse. <laughs> Sorry, David. No, um, but it is. It's um, Romans 8 and 28 in um, Holy Bible. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I have to look at my abuse like that, that uh, God had a purpose, and I'm going to use that for his glory. And that's what I do when I try to tell my story. So um, that's what a lot of people say is their verse that gives them courage. So I just thought I'd throw that out. Okay, David had something to say here. Well, I believe it's just an ability that the Lord has given you because he wants you to do 
just what you're doing now to to help so many people not only the people that are involved in this program but the society that is being harmed by this agenda because the capacity for evil that they have is just unbelievable when you just begin to think of the things that they could pull off with um, these controlled assassins at their beck and call, there's just no limit to it. And a very famous case that, uh, and, I, and I've heard you talk about this before, so I know you're aware of it, but maybe you could just briefly give us your take on Sirhan Sirhan, if you believe that yeah. Robert Kennedy's assassin involved in MK Ultra. Absolutely, I think this is uh, one of the, the, the first major successes in, in, in basically doing a false flag operation where they assassinated <clears throat> an incredible man uh, who was a real leader and could have made a, a huge influence on this country, I'm uh, sorry, in, in the world and in the, in the United States. <clears throat> and, and, and Sirhan Sirhan, the killer, uh, there's no question in my mind, let me give you some of the indications. First of all, during the actual event, the gun that he was holding had to be pried out of his hand by five people. Five people to pry the gun out of his hand. Now, the only way that could be is if he was in a hypnotic trance or dissociated or both, which typically would be both for this kind of operation. <coughs> Second, he had no memory of what happened that day forever to this day. He's rotting in jail, and he has no memory of what happened. And that's entirely consistent with being dissociated. Because when you're dissociated, the entire period of time that you're dissociated, let's say it's like three hours, that time, as soon as you get out of the dissociation period, and you're out of it now, you have no memory. You have amnesia about all that time that elapsed. And that amnesia will last from months to decades. And the reason it takes a, a long time is you have to have therapy, you have to have access to a safe environment. Now, Sirhan Sirhan is in maximum security jail. That's really not a safe environment. Jail is not safe. You have to have access to support from family and friends. And he has probably very little of the above, certainly not the security, the, the safe environment. So to this day, he has no recollection of what happened that day, which is entirely consistent with, in fact, it's about the only explanation for having that kind of amnesia is if he was torture trauma dissociated, it was scopalamine and hypnosis and all that. By the way, I just want to mention, uh, David and uh, Donna, that I really, really appreciate you spending uh, some time with me, uh, talking to me the other day and, and Skyping with me. And because, I mean, I, the spiritual support that you gave me uh, really made a difference, and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. We were glad to meet you and share that time with you too, Matthew. Yeah, we really, really were. And we just appreciate your heart and uh, what you're trying to do. And it's so, so very important. And this is such a huge part of this New World Order agenda that people really need to be aware of because it's, um, it's just a horrific thing. And it's one of those type of things that, it stretches our belief system that people would be so evil to do things like this. But this is exactly how the Nazis accomplished their near conquest of the world through these very same tactics that have now been imported into our country and our intelligence system. And uh, really, we should expect no less than people that will do whatever they need to do to seize control and to take power because this is just the story of the human race and yes. it's um it's just really a unique look into this that you're giving us and i think it's a look that uh quite frankly i don't know where else you would get this um look and this insight into this that we're we're getting with what you're telling us i i should i have a question ahead. before um before we go too much further now you've been you've been involved in this for a while, and this is this is something that's been going on, still continually going on. Um, how I mean, I, we've talked about this before, but how is this affecting your work, your family, uh, the people around you? Because obviously, it can't be um, it can't be a good thing. Obviously, and we've talked about it before, and you mentioned stuff about it. But go ahead and mention it to this crowd. I believe 
this is a different crowd than the TFR crowd. So, sure. Uh, well, uh, it's been quite frankly devastating uh, for all of the above categories uh, in terms of uh, my my life. I mean, my health has has diminished significantly because of uh, what they do with us is once we become whistleblowers and we've been in the program for a long time and we start to cause, you know, uh, resistance, uh, they graduate us to lethal weapons tests, just as was done by Dr. Joseph Mengel in the concentration camps of World War II, like Auschwitz. Uh, so I've had injections that cause cancer. I've had um, injections of biologicals, which cause illness. Um, and I've had chemicals uh, tested on me. And uh, I narrowly escaped death a few times so far. So my health has been impacted significantly. Uh, obviously, my mental health, but post-traumatic stress disorder is rather severe. Um, and finally, uh, they've gone after my wife now. And they're targeting her and threatening to hurt her. And they're threatening, like I was threatened in... Uh, in the February home invasion, which also turned into a, an abduction outside of my house to an apartment building nearby, uh, where a gunman, a hitman, was, was brought in to intimidate me. And they threatened to kill my six-year-old niece. Uh, so they're now traumatizing my family. And it's gotten to the point where uh, they've gone after my career now. They've attacked me in my workplace twice. Uh, the, my last two contracts have ended early. I'm a 30 years as a computer expert, systems analyst, architect, computer programmer. Uh, I was once chief scientist of a public company. And they have just neutralized my career here in Toronto by attacking me in the workplace, in an elevator, drugging me with scopolamine, spray to the face, injection right through my suit, and then literally, like, basically pushing me into the workplace naked and drugged and which obviously had catastrophic consequences on my career. And so the police can't do hardly anything because they're, they're not equipped to investigate crimes by professionals at doing crimes, professionals at doing black operations. They don't have the training and the manpower to be able to do this. They've tried, uh, I must give them credit, when they go by my house and they see that when I had bushes in the front, they would check the front bushes for me, you know, make sure no one was in there. That was, you know, it's the thought that counts. The, the other thing they did was they interrogated him. They got him into custody and interrogated him because I actually managed to grab some evidence of his actions. But they couldn't, they couldn't get him. They couldn't hold him for two reasons. One, he's not going to crack under torture, or sorry, crack under interrogation because he's trained to withstand torture in North Korea or something like that, right? Because he's a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Joint Task Force and also a member of the Civilian Intelligence Agency. Secondly, um, how can they uh, possibly get anything on him when there's no evidence, of the very, very little evidence to, 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 to try and hold him down with? Um, finally, he has diplomatic immunity. He works in the U.S. consulate here in Toronto on University Avenue. So he's untouchable, and therefore the police can't stop it. And so my career has been destroyed. I've lost my contract with a massive bank, which is so big, it owns two U.S. banks, and I was one of their top architects, and now I've lost it all. And I've lost the contract before for the same kind of thing. Someone came into the workplace and assaulted me. So I can't work anymore in my field in Toronto. Uh, so we have just sold the house a week ago, and we don't even know where we're going. I mean, we do have a condo nearby, but it doesn't make sense for me to be close to my wife when they're targeting my wife as a... As a as a man, you know, the first responsibility to my wife is to protect her. So if me being with her is going to put her in danger, then I have to leave. Really hate to hear that, Matthew, but you do have to do what you have to do to yeah. protect your loved ones. And it's yeah. hard choices sometimes. Um, we all may have to face something like that eventually as the world gets worse and worse. Uh, we don't know what we'll be called to do during times of tribulation. Can, can I just say one positive thing? I don't know. Uh, I don't want to make this too big. But 
there is some people in the civilian intelligence agency and particularly in the military who disagree with what's being done here. And in fact, I have been corrected in my book by Mitch. A number of details were corrected because he wanted to make sure the book went out. And he wanted to control the content. He actually deleted a major chapter, which I had to rewrite from scratch. He wanted to control the content, but he wanted the truth to come out. And which means that there's someone above him who's allowing him to get away with this. And so there, I'm alive. I mean, normally a person wouldn't live through to, to do the truth telling that I am. And because there are some people in those organizations that don't agree with the complete, uh, basically perversion of our democracy by forces greater than the United States of America, greater than Canada. We're talking worldwide forces that have a lot of power and these people don't like it. And therefore they see the misuse of this technology as a problem for our democracy. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the joint task force that this individual is involved with, that they have the oversight at Guantanamo Bay. That's right. And do you believe that MK Ultra is active at Guantanamo? I certainly do, because I have read online that there is a there was a psychological uh, or, or, or interrogation research facility going on, and uh, I think that um, uh, it's quite quite evident wherever there's been these kinds of uh, camps of people that have no rights that we see uh, research going on them, human experimentation. And uh, the people that have come out of there, some of them have reported uh, very unusual, horrific uh, psychological manipulations being done to them. Uh, so, yes, I think there is some MK Ultra R&D going on at Guantanamo Bay. This could certainly give us a unique perspective and understanding of why they would want to release so many of these people. This would give them um, control of actual people that are going back uh, into Islamic countries and the yes. possibilities there are just frightening for everybody concerned. Yes, I mean, I mean, we must say, of course, that like 90% of those people are innocent and we're not terrorists to begin with and we're rounded up because that was the way of, of getting more budget uh, to say that we have you no, know, we're getting all these terrorists and uh, this has been proven again and again. Uh, but I mean, I agree with you that the, the people that are being let go you know, who knows what's been done to them? Who knows if they're sleepers? I suspect that you're going to see a number of sleepers in, in that crowd. People that they can now control to do things for them in these countries. So what's the news right now with MK Ultra? Or, I mean, not sorry, not MK Ultra, but Guantanamo Bay. From what I understood, Obama was trying to move the um, prisoners to American soil over here. Um is that something I haven't looked up in a while? Have you been keeping track of Guantanamo? Well, a, a little bit. They've they've been resettled all around the world. They've been it's been a big di diplomatic challenge for the uh, the White House to try and find countries that will take these people because uh, they're you know like the Uruguayans, for example, who are these people from China who were you know uh, an ethnic tribe that are uh, the people that were really persecuted by the Chinese government. And they weren't terrorists. They were just caught up by some, you know, trigger happy uh, people and put into the Guantanamo. And now they can't go back to China. And it was really hard. But I think finally some of them have been given countries uh, that they are taking them in. So there's countries all around the world that are taking these people in. And yes, some in, in the United States as well. Um, so uh, I think there's still a core group there. And that is, you know, these people have not been charged with crimes. They're not terrorists, and, and they're still stuck in Guantanamo. So it's, it's a pretty sad human rights abuse. You know, the thing about it is, too, us taking in the Syrian refugees, who knows how many of them have been uh, trained in Guantanamo Bay, or not necessarily trained, but programmed there. Um, we have thousands upon thousands, probably millions of these individuals, if you, if you count the satanic ritual abuse victims, the MK Ultra victims, and all these other victims. Because uh, on the last show we talked, I, I talked to you, we tied in satanic ritual abuse and MK Ultra to using the same tactics uh, that they were using yes. in this government, uh, this government application. Um, now, I, if David and Donna, I don't know how much, where, where they're wanting to go with this exactly because I was trying to get their perspective on the interview. And um, I know John's stepping off his blood pressure. Pray for John because his blood pressure 
is super high. And uh, he just sent me a, a shot of his blood pressure. It's 147 over 99, which is extremely mm-hmm. high. So be in prayer for him tonight. He's he, I could I could see it on his face. He wasn't feeling well. And so I told him to check his blood pressure. I said, you look like, you know, you're, you know, you're not looking too good. So anyways, he, he told me he wasn't feeling right too. So he's uh, be in prayer for him right now. Cause I don't know. Um, that's high. That's super high. I know the bottom number is not supposed to be that high for sure. David, say a prayer right now, David. Let's just pray. Father, we just want to lift brother Hall up to you now, Lord Jesus. We just want to pray that right now by the, blood shed on Calvary's cross, that you just touch this blood pressure, that you just help it to adjust. Just bless him mightily, that he may be effective in your service. Lord, we just agree together in prayer for this now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah, so I just wanted to get that out out there. Um, and so, you know, I, I in the last interview, we had talked about uh, some of the stuff that they were using, some of the things they had programmed you with. Uh, and, and a lot of these things will, with the audience questions that we have here, will tie into that. They've done a really good job of asking some questions, and we have them over here on the right-hand side. Um, are you and uh, David, Donna, are you guys opposed to starting on the questions there, and then we can kind of move oh, on? Absolutely not. No, I absolutely did have not. one thing to say in support of what Matthew said a little bit earlier. Um, from the people we have dealt with in cults, um, yes, there seems to be a certain number of people when they come to us for help that they, it's, it is kind of generational in some cases and they don't really want to be a part of it. So some of them do speak out. So like, uh, Matthew said, there are some in that organization that don't want him to go ahead and speak out and there are people. And so I would just say by way of our listening audience here, that we all need to be very conscious of these people in our society because you never know when you might be able to help someone. So this is why, this is another reason why that now you see TV does these kind of programs to help educate us on things we should know on how we can help these people. So thank you, John and John. Definitely, yeah, that's the whole goal here. Go ahead, David. I saw your book. Well, one idea that I have, uh, how that the SRA uh, and the MK Ultra ties in, what I believe is that in satanic ritual abuse and in CIA programs like Rendition, that they are just refining their arts. They are wanting to get their arts fine enough to where they won't have Matthew Pauly's that they can't control, that uh, are aware of the things that are going on. I think a lot of it, they're just trying out to see what they can do, to see if they really can uh, program people to carry out acts that they normally wouldn't do. And I think this is one of the big connections with SRA and MK Ultra because a lot of these cults that propagate uh, satanic ritual abuse, they're tied right back into Freemasonry and right back into the government. And yeah. you I don't know. Did you guys listen to the show I did with uh, him on TFR where we talked about the different uh, tactics? Did you guys yes. listen? To that? Yeah, yes. it's astounding the uh, connections that be made there. There's no doubt about it there. And oh, yeah. uh, you know, I, I just I, I just think about all the different people that have been hurt by this and affected by this, and it makes you wonder what the plan is. But um, yeah, yeah. and any- a lot of these were developed with Timothy Leary back in the late 50s and the early 60s when LSD was still legal and he was working for the Massachusetts uh, prison system and state funded programs that he did on inmates to actually see what he could do and he made the statement that with the right uh, proportions of fear, music, sex and drugs that he could make anyone do anything he wanted. And we, could, of course, we can tie Mr. Leary right back into the Golden Dawn and uh, a lot of other subversive movements. So I think there's a very, very real connection. Most most certainly. And um, so, yeah, we'll go ahead and jump into some questions. If we've already asked these, just, uh, you know, we can just clarify them a little bit or kind of go a different angle with them. But um, Donna asked earlier, um, how many times do you believe that you have been accessed by these people? A dozen. 
a dozen times approximately. Um, I mean, uh, I, I, it's almost hard to keep count. Uh, the, the, there's at least uh, five home invasions, uh, including four abductions, plus the 2005 uh, horrific uh, interrogation and mind control programming, plus 2007, I was uh, given a forced electroshock in the back of a van uh, because I started writing a book, and they said, Matthew, you've been a very bad boy. You know, you're not supposed to write, you're not supposed to talk about this. We warned you, we warned you, and they attached the things to my, my temples, and then, and then I was out. And uh, they, when I woke up, they, I didn't even know where I lived. They had to tell me my address. And so they destroyed my, my mind. They, they wiped out a lot of memory. And uh, then in 2008, there was a, an event which I can't go into because uh, I've been threatened on the, for death. Uh, and my line got cut on Coast to Coast when I, uh, with George Norrie when I tried to talk about 2008. So I won't talk about that. Then 2010, uh, there was a, a, a big uh, event called bumper lock surveillance, level five, maximum. This is this surveillance meant to think you're going to be murdered. I actually had a gun pulled on me. And it's meant to discredit you because you'll seek help uh, from the police and they won't help you because you don't have evidence. So you'll try and go to a locked ward. And that's the whole point is to, to discredit you. And then in 2014, it started with a lethal weapons test. Um, and that was a pretty bad one. Um, scopolamine aerosol fog. And I was only two blocks away. And my dog was mortally injured in that. Um, and then it picked up uh, from there. 2014 to the present, it's been very, very heavy. Every few months, uh, a major event. I also noticed another question someone asked. Uh, you know, what are they using me for? What are the programs that they you know, program me to do? And that's a good question. Um, maybe we should, uh, I should first of all say that everything that I'm going to tell you that's con that is in my conscious mind means it's no longer effective. Because the whole point of this programming is you have to be in that amnesic window of time where you don't know about the programming for it to be effective. So they can trigger you with a trigger, and then you'll perform the hypnotic program. Now that I've remembered these things, they have no effect on me. So the first program in 2005 in the back of that van, after they interrogated me as a, as a mock Islamic inter uh, Arabic uh, terrorist, and they asked me if I was a member of Hezbollah and a member of uh, Hamas, and a whole bunch of other organizations, and it went on and on and on. After an hour of that, they taught coercive interrogation techniques, no mark torture. So the Can American was teaching the Canadian Special Forces how to do no mark torture on me. And then they went, the last half was this mind control programming, where they tortured me until I dissociated, and then they hypnotized me and made me repeat post-hypnotic suggestions. The first one was, if I find a gun in my jacket pocket, I will immediately go to the nearest closet in my home. But before getting in the closet, I will turn the safety off on the handgun. Then I will step into the closet, close the door, and put the gun up to my head and pull the trigger in one smooth motion. And that was repeated about a dozen times. And then I had to repeat about five times. I will never remember this program until I find a gun in my jacket pocket. And so I'm under hypnosis at this point. I'm under, I'm under uh, dissociation. I have total amnesia afterwards. If I had found a gun in my jacket pocket while that program was still not remembered, I would have probably killed myself. Um, the second one was, I, need, I won't give you the exact verbatim for this because it's too dangerous, but I was programmed that when a certain person introduced themselves or any person introduced themselves with a control name that was agreed upon, if this control name person introduced themselves to me, I would treat them as my best friend and do anything they want me to do, including kill and they trained me on how I was to kill. The third program was that if I ever found myself alone with a doctor or a nurse in a hospital that was wearing, uh, in the psychiatric hospital or the psychiatric ward of a hospital, that was wearing a stethoscope, I would immediately strangle them with it. And he pulled out a real stethoscope and he folded it over and he showed me how to strangle somebody with it. So and this is really disturbing stuff I'm relating. And by the way, my doctor was not very impressed with that last one. He was quite upset about that. Um, and uh, I can tell you that these things are designed so that if I ever went to try and get help for post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, that uh, what would happen was I would discredit myself and get myself locked away for life by killing somebody, right? That's the whole point of that one. Then, so those are the three big ones from 2005. And since that time, there has been so many of these MK Ultra experiments done on me in, in my house mostly, 
uh, that I actually, in my book, I document just in January 2015, there was four MK Ultra experiments where they programmed me to do something and then they trigger it weeks later in the real world and see what my reaction would be. And so it's this document in my book. It's actually quite interesting. And it shows you how basically there's a pattern here of getting me to do ever more escalating things that are against my will, against my self-interest, and against my, my will to survive, my instinct to survive. And, and these experiments and the results are all documented in my book. And uh, the, uh, one of the more recent ones that's apropos is you might have noticed me doing this in the interview where I'm nodding my head like this. This was programmed. I was, and this is weird because I, I have to catch myself from doing it because I, he wants me to discredit myself and look like I have some sort of Asperger's or something like that by continuously nodding my head like this. See, I was programmed to do that. And so I have to keep catching myself and stopping myself from doing that. Um, so these are just minor things to try and try and mess with my ability to communicate as a whistleblower. Um, and uh, I was programmed uh, to exit to a certain country uh, because uh, they want me to go to a certain country where they will be all ready for me. And when I get there, I'll probably be killed. So I'm not going to that country. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so, I mean, you, you've, your, your, your professionalism is – or your uh, your pro professional ability is computer programming, right? Have they, yes. have they not used you for anything to do with that? Because that would seem like something that they would really uh, tap into. Yes, thankfully they overlooked that uh, because it's very easy to get arrested for hacking. And uh, thankfully they overlooked that uh, because that is something obviously I could do. Uh, but uh, that would be bad. Um, and the thing is I've told the police all this. And I mean police statements, and it, they just can't seem to do anything significant to stop this. So it, it's sort of like I don't have any choice. I have to leave because I'm only 20 minutes away from his workplace and about 25 minutes away from where he lives. So he can just zoom by here anytime he wants and cause trouble uh, and do horrible crimes against humanity. I have, have they... Um... I, this is hard to hear because I mean I've heard it before already, and it's just an amazing thing, or not amazing in a good way, but a really horrifying thing to think that this can be done to somebody, and they know about it, but they can't get help to be stopped. And and I know that uh, you probably tried many things, but have you tried hidden cameras before? Have you tried? Um, oh, have, let me let me comment on hidden cameras. Okay, I mentioned the RCMP were involved in the 2005 event. That's our Canadian, Royal Canadian Mounted Police paramilitary. And they were involved. They actually hooked up all the torture. Uh, the, the RCMP officer hooked up all the torture equipment, including uh, taping my eyelids open. Uh, I had an, uh, a 100cc uh, uh, syringe of sodium pentothal taped to my arm and inserted, needle inserted. And I had an electroshock cuff in my upper right arm, and I went to a remote control that Mitch had. And I was uh, hand and leg cuffed into a torture chair. So the RCMP have been involved from this from the beginning. Now, last year in 2015, I went to the number one guy, the, the company, the spy company, uh, spy technology company in Toronto for doing hidden cameras. I gave him $3,500 cash. And I said, I need you to install these cameras. Because the Toronto police, they said to me, look, Matthew, to help you, you need to get evidence for us. Get hidden cameras. So I went to the specialist. I gave him the cash. Three or four weeks later, in August, beginning or middle of August, I contacted him. I went to see him, and I said, what is going on? Why have you not done this yet? You keep giving me all these excuses. What's the problem? He said, look, I'm really sorry. I can't do your job. The RCMP came to my office. They said, oh, your name came up our, in our investigation of Mr. Pauly because I'd sent him an email, right? And so they knew that what I was doing with him. And they said, your name came up. And uh, he said he couldn't do my cameras anymore. So the RCMP intimidated him so that I couldn't put in the cameras, the hidden cameras, which would protect me. Now, that's interesting because in May, just a few months earlier, in 2015, the RCMP came to my house. Mitch let them in the front door after I had been drugged and tortured. 
and he let them in the front door and they came upstairs. They stood in my bedroom door with the door open with a recording device and had me confess to two terror plots. And this is important to mention here because there, by, this is a classic fascist technique is you, you take the whistleblower and you portray them as a terrorist. So they have me on tape confessing to sending hobby rockets with explosives at the U.S. consulate in Toronto to blow it up. They have me on tape confessing to um, de detonating an electromagnetic pulse device uh, on Front Street in Toronto near the Internet Hub to try and take out most of Canada's Internet. They have me from 2005 confessing to being an Islamic fundamentalist terrorist who knew how to make bombs and was going to blow up the CN Tower. They have so many forced confessions out of me that it's just mind-boggling. So now, apparently, I am so much... He, Mitch has been so successful with this that the U.S. government now has me labeled as a terrorist, which means the moment uh, they, they want to, they are legally, according to presidential orders... Well, there's another one. They can take me out. They can kill me. Is that when I was abducted in the February home invasion to that building, that apartment building I mentioned earlier, and there was that gunman there. His name is Roberto. He invented... He says, my name is Roberto, I'm from Central America. You know what I do for a living? And I said, yeah, you're a hitman. He said, yeah, that's right, Matthew, you're smart. Me and Mitch were talking about you. And he had this 45 pointed at me, and he turned the safety off, and I was just backing up against the wall of the kitchen. And I don't know what, how I came up with this, but I said, is that a 45? I said, one question, just one question. He said, yeah, okay, one question. I said, is that a 45? And he said, yeah, that's my baby. It's a 45. And he massages the gun like this. I said, oh, I've never seen one before. And they started coming closer and closer and closer. And Mitch just took, Mitch is smart. And he goes, stop, stop, put the gun away, put the gun away. He's going to grab it. He's going to grab it. And it's true, true, true enough, I may have grabbed it. Uh, I have had some training. You might, why, why am I training martial arts? Because I'm trying to survive, right? I mean, I've been grabbed and snatching grabs off the street. I've had home invasions, so I've trained in some martial arts. But the reason I went here is because in that home invasion, before Roberto came in with the 45, Mitch, I didn't even know he was coming. Mitch led me into this apartment building, and I'm scopalamine. I'm torture trauma dissociated. I have no willpower. He leads me into the building to about the 15th floor. We go into this two-bedroom apartment. With, I assumed it was two-bedroom because it had a massive kitchen. And there was no knickknacks. Didn't look like anybody was living there. And he says, Matthew, you know, I think you're just a bullshitter. I don't think you're really a martial arts guy. You don't know any martial arts. And I'm, I'm just ignoring him. And he keeps going. He's teasing me like, ah, oh, come on, Matthew. You know, you're just a bullshitter. You don't know any martial arts. He kept going with this, right? So finally, and I'm getting a little, little angry. And he says, all right, Matthew, come on. Show me. Demonstrate on me. Come on. Demonstrate on me. So, I mean... You can imagine after being tortured from somebody, from somebody over 10 years, you, you might want to actually attack him would be, you know, okay. So I attacked him, and I got him from behind. I got him to the floor. I was putting him into a double choke. Just as I'm applying the second hand in a double choke, Roberto comes in with the 45. And I just drop Mitch on the floor immediately. And Mitch looks at the guy and says, you took long enough. And he looks at me, you didn't expect that, did you? And I said, no, I didn't expect that. And then they proceed to have me sit down on the kitchen floor, put my legs out, and he says, Matthew, are you right-handed or left-handed? Oh, before, but before we get into that, the next thing he does is he pulls out a tape recorder. It was actually an iPhone, and he points it in my face, and he says, now, you got to say, Matthew, I was trying to kill you. And I said, I wasn't trying to kill you. I was going to let you go as soon as you tapped out. Like in martial arts training, when you, someone taps out, you stop, Right. And I said, I was going to let you go if you tapped out. And he said, never mind, Matthew. You're going to say it. I was trying to kill you. Say it. And then he starts to reach for his gun. And as soon as he starts pulling out his gun, I'm done, right? I'm, I'm terrified. I, I don't like guns. So I said it. I said, okay, I was trying to kill you. So that's the third forced confession. Now, it, it turns out Obama made a presidential order that the, the, the criterion for selecting how to, uh, whether or not someone should be an assassination target is are they a threat to U.S. military personnel? And because of that confession, I mean, after all, Mitch is a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. military joint task force. I am now an assassination target. And they can take me out anytime, anywhere, but particularly outside of Canada. Um, 
Now, let me just finish with a story. So I'm in the kitchen. He tells me to spread my legs out, uh, straight out. I put my legs straight out. And he says, Matthew, you're right-handed or left-handed? And I said, well, I'm right-handed. He said, are you sure, Matthew? Because you get this wrong, you're going to die. You might die. I said, I'm right-handed. I'm absolutely sure I'm right-handed. He says, okay, good. Now take off your sock. So I take off my sock. And then Roberto, the gunman, puts this battery clip on my second toe. And I'm thinking, what's this about, right? And, and so he puts this battery clip on my second toe. It was non-serrated, so it wouldn't leave marks. And then Roberto's holding this chromed metal thing, very phallic looking. And it has a rubber insulator on his side of it. And Mitch says, now you touch that, Matthew. And I said, no, I'm not going to touch that. Even though I was torture trauma dissociated and scopolamine, I still didn't want to touch that because I knew what was going to happen. And he starts pulling out his gun again, right? And so, okay, I touched it. And then, bang, I was out. I mean, it was like a bolt of lightning went from my arm through my body to my leg. It was my right, actually. And it was so horrific, so powerful, I just went out. So I was electrocuted with a vehicle battery three blocks from the center of Canada's largest city. And we are, of course, the number one ally of the United States of America. So like some third world dictatorship, you know, torture technique, right? I almost died. When I woke, I had an arm around me by uh, Roberto, arm around me by Mitch. I'm sitting on the floor. They're talking about me. My eyes are closed. And when I open my eyes, Mitch says, oh, you're back. I didn't know if you were going to make it. You stop breathing. That's okay. I restarted your breathing. So that's the gruesome February 22nd, or February um, home invasion and abduction, which involved not only a forced confession as a, someone trying to kill a U.S. personnel, but being electrocuted with a vehicle battery. It was actually, I, I even asked them, I said, is that a car battery you use? And they said, no, actually, it's a, it is a vehicle battery, but it's actually a motorcycle battery. And they said, you know why we use it a motorcycle battery? And I said, yeah, because it's more portable. And they said, yeah, that's right, Matthew. So they carried a motorcycle battery in for that purpose. But, I mean, wow, that's that's outrageous. I mean, that's uh, that. So that's the kind of stuff you've been going through for a long time. I uh, there's a couple more questions. There's a bunch more questions in here, so I'm gonna kind of scroll through them here and feel free to expand any way you want. We don't have a set time sure. limit or anything like that on this show. So you know, normally we go two hours, but you know, if it goes under or over. It's no big deal on here. So, okay, um, let me see where we're at here. So we asked that one. We've got tons of them in here. I'm scrolling through. Um, from Jordan, have you noticed more or less harassment from these sickos? Sickos or psychos? I don't know exactly. After going on John B. Wells and now you see TV show. Less. Uh John B. Wells uh, was a pretty big win. Um, I'm just trying to think, was that before or after July 11th? July 11th was the devastation at work. Um, I believe it was uh, before uh, John B. Wells. Yeah, and uh, so these, since John B. Wells, um, I have not seen any obvious activity, um, except that that, well, within hours, I had cars parked in front of my house with surveillance devices poking out of the roof uh, and shady-looking people uh, getting out of them and, and then coming back after a few hours. And then I saw our Canadian, uh, Canadian Security Intelligence Service ladies, uh, who are the good people, uh, who are actually trying, they're running counter-surveillance in front of my house. When they see that I'm at high risk after these interviews, like they might be out at my place tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, when they think I'm at high risk. And the whole point of them being there is that's a communication from spy to spy that we're watching Matthew. If you, you don't try anything with Matthew because we're watching. Um, so there's been some of that uh, throughout, which is good. I mean, at least I have one group of people uh, in, in the Canadian security apparatus who have been doing some monitoring and some counter surveillance. But they still have yet to meet with me. I've said to them, look, you know, you should meet with me and, debrief, and let me debrief. I can tell you so much, not just about the U.S. stuff, but there's other intelligence agencies involved in this, one other intelligence agency. And there's stuff that's just important for Canadian government to know, but they haven't met with me. Um, 
So there's been less since I've been doing this, this, this John D. Wells and then your interview and, and, and others in the last uh, month or two. Okay. Very cool. I'm glad. Uh, hopefully it, it gets less and less as they continue. They leave you alone. That would be great. I know we're praying for you and I know, um, you know, we're, we really, we really hope you're free of this because I know this is, has to be just the most disturbing thing. Uh, I don't, I can't imagine much worse being going on, going on in somebody's life because, um, you know, there's, there are bad things that happen to people, obviously, but an ongoing thing, never knowing when you're going to live or if you're going to be able to live till tomorrow, never knowing if you're going to be killed, never knowing if your family is going to leave you, never knowing what, you know, all those things are, are horrifying. So, uh, the next question we have, uh, is from CB. Yeah. Is, is, is there a difference in MK ultra victims and targeted individuals of gang stalking? Um, yes, there's a difference. Uh, target individual, if you remember back in mathematics, you have like a Venn diagram. So the TIs would be a large circle, literally of, of a million or more people uh, in the United States and Canada, um, over a million. But uh, MK Ultra people is a tiny circle in the middle of maybe, you know, like I said before, about 5,000 or 10,000 in the U.S. and maybe 500 to 1,000 in Canada. And uh, the, 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 the targeting of those people is really, really physical. I mean, we're talking, you know, in-your-face torture and guns put to your head and, and drugging and, and assaults, um, whereas uh, the general TI thing is more uh, gang stalking and uh, directed energy weapons for the end game. Uh, and so, yeah, there is a difference. But, I mean, obviously there are similarities too. We're, we're, we're targeting individuals have the same issues. Um, but the, the MP Ultra thing is, 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 I mean, it's almost like a more pointy stick uh, directed by fewer people. Now, within that MK Ultra circle, you have a much smaller circle, which is the super soldiers. Super soldiers are those people who have been in MK Ultra since essentially birth or early childhood. And these are people that have been specially chosen to become, throughout their lives, assets of the intelligence agencies who are so messed up by the time they hit teenage uh, time, they probably got dozens of altars. And these are sub-personalities. These people have what I call dissociative identity disorder. It used to be called multiple personality disorder. And these people are, are, you know, so abused, probably the most abused people on the earth. And then they go into the military, and they learn how to kill effectively. And then they're used for, you know, I told you about the three guys in San Benedito that were across the medical center, all dressed in black with bulletproof vests and balaclavas, and they were shooting women and children and everybody those would have been super soldiers. So there's like three circles, three concentric circles. Super soldiers, the MK Ultra, and then a larger TI. Wow. Okay. Uh, for the next question here, what is the best way for you to protect yourself from the abuse, from the MK Ultra abuse? Well, I... I wish I could speak from experience. I mean, I haven't obviously been very successful at protecting myself. Um, and the only thing I haven't tried yet is to leave. And I have been told by others that, that leaving, you know, is probably the best thing you can do. And, but then again, those others hadn't gone so high profile as I've gone. Uh, so uh, I think it's a big question mark whether or not leaving is going to really end up helping me or not. But I'm, I'm certainly uh, uh, willing to try anything. I mean, I need to, I need to try and survive, and because I want to make the message, I want to make a difference in this planet. I don't have that much time left. I mean, I probably have five years at the most because of the these cancer injections that I've had, and I can, I, I just, I, I want to do everything I can, and and to do that, I have to be alive. I'm particularly looking for a religious community that would take me in. Well, if there's anybody listening that has a community in the Canada area that would be willing to take Matthew in, it would be greatly appreciated. And um, tell them, Matthew, real quick, how they can get a hold of you uh, if the, if for this reason or for an, for nothing else to order your Sure, book. sure. Um, so uh, the, the, the important thing, I think, for people to write down, if they're going to write down something to get a hold of me, would be to write down my Facebook profile. 
because I talk to everybody on Facebook and uh, it also has all my interviews as well and and, and I, I use it quite a lot and so that's uh, facebook.com forward slash Matthew M-A-T-T-H-E-W dot Pauly P-A-U-L-E-Y 99 by the way uh, that E is just for my Facebook page because the other the name was taken already so again, that's Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W dot Pauly, P-A-U-L-E-Y 99. And that's my Facebook profile. And I'll give you one more link, and that's my uh, publisher or book distributor uh, spotlight page, which has a lot of interviews I've done, and my book is for sale there as well. Although it's available from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and places like this, but this is a good site because it has sort of my personal page. And that's lulu.com, L-U-L-U dot com, forward slash spotlight, just like it sounds, spotlight, forward slash Matthew Pauly, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-P-A-U-L-Y, no E. So it's just uh, P-A-U-L-Y. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so this next question is a little bit out of order, but I'm going to ask it because it goes along with what you're talking about. And it says, are you able to go off grid um, basically the reason they're asking is because are asking if you have any chips in you that can possibly track you. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid that the likelihood of that is rather high uh, because I've been put unconscious so many times and I've actually awoke with scars. Uh, I had a scar here uh, that had, it was like a zipper, like a Chevron. Uh, and there was, these were scars and it was done with a machine that literally ironed on, basically sutured together uh, where there'd been a cut in the flesh. So uh, that's probably not a good, th not a good sign. Uh, also in the van in 2005, uh, an air gun was used in the back of my neck uh, to, to shoot something in, in, up the base of my skull. And now I don't know, was this a false, fake operation to make me think that I'd had something inserted, or was something really inserted? Um, I had different results on MRIs. One MRI showed something, and then all of a sudden, when I got to my doctor, it didn't show something. Because they, they called me into the hospital to, to coach me and say that this, don't worry about this, it's just a little stone or something, don't worry about this. And, but then when I got to my doctors, there was a different one, different letter too, from the specialist. So they were monkeying around there. Um, and there was also an insertion with a needle into my inner ear, right through my ear, into my inner ear twice. And I've gone to a specialist, ear, nose, and throat specialist, and I have a whole buildup of fluid in here. I've lost about one-third of my hearing. Uh, and he wanted to do surgery to put in a drain, and I said, no, no surgery. Like, uh, going under general anesthetic, you know, is a dangerous thing, uh, and particularly with my situation, going into a hospital. So, um, so yeah, the chances of me having, uh, an, you know, a chip are pretty high. All right, Diana asks, can you ask Matthew to discuss his tattoo, the one that he got as a precaution? Yeah, so being creative, uh, I thought to myself, well, I'm at great risk here as being used. I mean, that's what MKUltra is all about, right, is using people to do things against their will. And if you want someone to self-destruct, the biggest, most effective way is to use them in a, in a false flag terror event. That is to say, a hate crime, a shooting, assassination, or a mass attack with a deadly weapon. So I thought, okay, I, I'm a humanist, you know, and, and, and I, I'm spiritual, and I, I do not like hurting people. That is not, I, I'm against that. So I'm going to stop this. I, I've got this tattoo, and this tattoo on my thigh basically marks my body and says, this is my name, and this is the story. I'm a non-consensual uh, sleeper assassin test subject. Dr. Coroner, colon. Look for scopalamine and other poisons. Contact the Toronto Star uh, news columnists. So it right away says that if they, if they found my body in a, in, in a, in a major crime, that, that this major crime has probably been staged. Now that being said, it, uh, Mitch pointed out to me that they now have a chemical. Actually, with the newspaper, the Toronto Star, three days after I sent them the tattoo, ran a big article on page A2 saying, there's this new substance that can wipe off tattoos. It's a new chemical. It's under R&D right now. It's going to be commercialized soon. So, 
and letting me know that, you know, it, this is not such a great insurance policy. And, and Mitch actually said that to me, too. He said, look, the chemical's out there. We've got it. He says, in fact, I'm getting my tattoo taken off with it. So we can wipe that off you any time. Don't think you're safe. You know, one thing that I would suggest, and this is just a suggestion, is uh, giving several notes to several people via uh, there's there's messages you can store in bank vaults and have it pass on to somebody when you die. The only problem is I guess you would want to get it to them like as soon as you die. That might create a little issues, but uh, maybe getting several people you trust with messages um, if there is anybody you trust anymore so that they can pass these messages on to the morgue. Um, it's just, I'm sure you've thought about that, but just a suggestion that came to mind uh, that may be uh, something that um, that helps in the future. I'm not sure. Hopefully this never happens. Hopefully the prayer, hopefully, um, hopefully you'll be delivered from this, Matthew. This is a horrible thing to go through. So this is the next question. I think this is a really good question by Ed because I was wondering this myself. Um, does Matthew think that some of the abduction by greys or alien memories are connected with MK ultra experiences? Okay. So that's a good question. Now I got to say up front, um, I have nothing against people who uh, believe in aliens and also in UFOs. And I think as Carl Sagan once wrote, the idea that we're alone in this universe and there's no other intelligent life is quite naive and arrogant. However, because our media and our general knowledge is accepted by science, has not accepted the existence of aliens and UFOs, it means as a whistleblower of something really serious that we whistleblowers have to say, no, actually, we're not going to talk about that subject because anybody who quotes me now about that subject is going to be discrediting my story in the, in the eyes and the ears of the news media consumers who believe that UFOs and aliens don't exist. So I, like on my Facebook page, if someone starts putting in comments about aliens and UFOs, I just shut it down because my message is really serious. It's really important. And I don't want people not to believe me because other items that are not yet considered uh, science, truth, fact, uh, are, are present. And in fact, we must remember that this is one of the major disinformation techniques that the CIA, oh, sorry, Civilian Intelligence Agency, and other organizations use to discredit whistleblowers is they'll go on their, their websites and their chat rooms and they'll put stuff about UFOs and aliens and stuff and, and also say that they're paranoid schizophrenic. That's another number one top disinformation technique. Uh, so that's my answer to that. Okay, and Valerie asks, can somebody be under this control and not know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's the scary thing is that after these events, like for example, I awoke in the week of June 19th with two little holes in the center of my chest, the little, little perforations of the skin about only like a quarter inch apart. And I didn't know what it was or maybe a half inch. I can't remember exactly half to a quarter. I didn't know what it was. How is it that I had these two distinctive marks in the center of my chest? And now it's only been, uh, that was, you know, June 19th, week of June 19th. Now here we are in uh, September, the latter part of September, that I've remembered, recalled what happened. But what happened was when Mitch had come after my, my wife by, by some of these activities that he was doing to me, I basically resisted physically and I started to attack him. And he tasered me with a taser. And uh, that's how he brought me down. And he tasered me in the heart. I was actually lying on the ground at this point because after I had thrown him to the ground, and, he, and I was out now on the ground, I'm lying on my back. He said, you just stay right here. And because I'm torture, trauma, dissociated, and all that stuff, I just stayed there on my back. He came into the room, and he tasered me right in the heart. And he said, now that was an attempted assassination because he aimed it right at my heart. And that's why I had those two marks. And uh, luckily, I didn't die but I was completely incapacitated. I mean, I've never been tased before in my life, uh, and that was pretty scary, I'll tell you. Yeah, very scary to think that people could be under this and not know, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I can tell you this, I had an experience, I, I've told you guys the experience I had with a guy that had been under what he called um, special classes in school and um, had 
issues like this. And I believe he was probably a part of a program similar to this at one time here in Evansville, Indiana. Um, so anyways, we'll, we'll move on to the next um, question here. This one's by Diana. Have they tried to institutionalize Matthew or label him a paranoid schizophrenic? I ask not because I think he's crazy. I know he's telling the truth and these things really happen, but I'm wondering if they have tried to discredit him by labeling him crazy. Only um, in some of the, the comments under my Sean Stone interview in uh, 2015, uh, they tried at that point, somebody tried, who was obviously working, being paid, uh, to label me that way, to try and discredit me. Uh, so they try that, but I have so many people who see my message as truthful and believe me that they usually jump all over those people, and it usually kind of backfires when they do that. I should mention that I have a letter which is in the preface of my book. It's the last page of the preface, and it's a letter prepared by a psychiatrist who I was seeing for post-traumatic stress disorder from 26, 2006 to 2011, five years for an hour a, a week. And in that letter, he says, you know, at first I had concerns that Matthew's reports about being interrogated and tortured by uh, government anti-terrorist forces might be false. So we tried uh, drug trials on, on three of the most efficacious antipsychotics, including clozapine. And after these, these trials, he has full memory and certainty and recall of these events, and he has not been diagnosed with a delusional illness. So they tested me, and they couldn't find anything. So and I have that document, signed letter from a psychiatrist in my book, by permission of the psychiatrist. Very good. Okay, so uh, the next question uh, is by George, and this is a good question. I asked you this on the last show we were together on TFR. He says, uh, question for Matthew. Was there any spiritual overtones to the programming he went under or any mention of Satan or Jesus? Um, there was the satanic uh, symbology and a satanic voice that was used on me. In the, I was w forced to wear 3D goggles in the van during the mind control programming part in 2005. And, and they put in a DVD and they played this stuff to me. And some of it was satanic imagery. And it was really scary stuff. And they also forced me to watch a short bit of uh, Snow White, the Disney film, with a slightly different soundtrack. And it was a very uh, low, gravelly, scary voice that was sort of satanic sounding uh, in that soundtrack. And I refused to watch it. And uh, I, I, anyway, so um, I was closing my eyes. Well, I couldn't really close my eyes. They were taped open. But I was, you know, shaking my head and, you know, saying, I can't watch this. And... And then again in uh, 2015, January, when I was abducted to a Lakeshore area warehouse in Toronto, uh, and the, I mean, this was a horror show out of the movie, there was a dentist chair, and I was forced to lie down in this dentist chair with this light, and he was going at my teeth. And uh, then he made me sit in this chair and watch this movie, and there was a lot of uh, bodies and dead people, and, and it was just really disturbing stuff. Interesting. So yeah, that's that that right there tells me that there is a deeper side to all this other than physical. Um, and so let's go on to Ed uh, Ed's question here. This is a good question. Um, and he says, "Okay, please understand my heart in asking this question. Not cold or uncaring at all. Just have to ask: How can Matthew be sure that going rogue slash whistleblower is not the intended action?" by the controllers. I'm sure he has thought about this. Well, um, uh, here I know it wasn't the intended action originally because in 2007, the, the event that they did against me was to do a snatch and grab off King Street in Toronto and using an inhalant soaked rag over my mouth, pull me into the back of the van in a headlock and I went unconscious. When I woke up, I was in this gurney strapped to this gurney, and that's when they said, you know, Matthew, you've been a bad boy. You've been talking about what happened. You're not supposed to talk about what happened. We warned you. We warned you. And then they put the ECT on me. Electroconvulsive therapy was not therapy. Uh, so they clearly did not want me to go public originally. But when they saw over a period of 10 years that I just would not stop, and I kept writing this book and rewriting this book, and, and I was pushing to get this book done, at some point they figured out, well, you know, we can't really kill him because he's going to draw a lot of attention if we kill him. 
or and then then they realized well maybe we'll try and co-opt the thing they tried to co-opt the book and tried to change it and tried to delete chapters and stuff but it didn't work i just kept rewriting everything um so they but they tried to then contribute a little bit by making corrections to some of the things and i knew they were some of these corrections were correct i didn't correct all the things but a few of the ones that they said they actually did sound make sense that, that it was truthful for example the time of approach on Young Street in 2005 was 9.40 p.m., which made more sense because at the donut shop when I left, it was 9.32 p.m., and I walked my friend from the donut shop down to the subway two blocks, came back north. That would be about eight minutes. So I changed it in my book to 9.40. Um, other things, little things like that, little details. The, 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 so they were actually trying to contribute to the effort. So the answer is yes, it, it eventually... They tried to basically encourage me to be the whistleblower because they realized, some people in the organization realized that, hey, I could make a difference here for the good of the country, for the good of humanity. All right, very interesting. Net Matthew, this is something I want to give you as advice and also just to try out uh, if this happens to you again. I want to ask you if you, and ask if you've ever done it, but when this has happened to you, I would ask, because I've had an experience, spiritual experiences, but, uh, you know, trying to be abducted in this spiritual experience, and I called on the name of Yeshua or Jesus. Yeshua is his Hebrew name. Jesus is his English name, and the the thing stopped. Have you ever tried that? And if not, will you try that the next time that this happens? Uh, the answer is no. I have not tried it before, but after what happened the other night, um, uh, with the Carico's help, I, I think that I'm going to try that next time. Um, if it ever is a next time, uh, I'm I'm going to do that. Yes. Awesome. I pre- I really want that for you because I, you know, according to the scripture, his name is the name above all names, and the demons fear his name. And if these people, which I believe probably are, are intact with demons, uh, this could be a possible help. I know that in my situation that I had. Uh, where I felt like I was being abducted by something, whether a uh, demon, uh, whatever it may have been, um, when I I couldn't even talk because I my throat was being choked, but I in my head I said those names. I said Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, Yahweh. I just used all the names that I could think of for the Father and the Son, and it stopped instantly. So I just you know I wanted to throw that out there. Um, there's no more questions in the chat, but uh, one thing I would like to tell anybody out there that is experiencing anything like this uh, that you you can contact David or Donna. Uh, David and Donna are um, trained in, not not trained, but they've been dealing with people for 30 years that have been involved either in satanic ritual abuse, MK Ultra, all these different things. And so they can, they are good about, you know, being able to pray with you, help you, talk to you and do that kind of stuff. I'd say call me, but I don't think that I would do much good other than, you know, I, I feel sorry for you and I would pray for you, but David and Don have been dealing with this for a long time. Uh, Matthew, I want to give you one more opportunity or many, uh, you can say it 50 times if you want, I don't really care, but tell people how they can get your book, how they can get a, in touch with you and how they can um, help because I know you have a petition um, right now as well that you would like people to sign. Yes, absolutely. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so the book is called The Murder of Time, Making and Unmasking a Sleeper by Matthew Pauly, P-A-U-L-Y. And you can get it by going to lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com forward slash spotlight, just like it sounds, L-I-G-H-T, spotlight.com. Sorry, spotlight forward slash Matthew Pauly, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-P-A-U-L-Y. And Donna, can you put that in the chat if you can remember it or in that way people in the chat can go and fill that out because that's going to be very hard to remember. Um, And, you know, make sure you guys get a hold of them on Facebook so you can remember that as well. Uh, But say say that website one more time and I'll type it in there. Sure. Uh, Lulu, L-U-L-U dot com forward slash spotlight forward slash Matthew Pauly, two T's in Matthew. (laughs) One more time, Lulu dot com. Yeah. Spotlight. Spotlight. Okay, okay go, go ahead with Forward that. Forward slash uh, Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, Pauly, P-A-U-L-Y. L-Y or L-E-Y, just Matthew. It's just no E. 
There we go. I, I, I put it in there. So thank you. Yeah. And uh, so make sure you guys go check out the book, sign the petition. Uh, let's get this. And David and Donna, if you guys have any more questions or suggestions to the audience, um, feel free to do so. And I just want to thank you guys uh, all so much for coming on the show. This has been a blessing. And I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of people out here that can relate to this. There's people that are being gang stalked. There's people that are being uh, ritually abused. There's people that are being uh, under this program, MK Ultra, all over the world. And if you're listening to this right now, there is help. And I believe that there is help in the Messiah as well. I think that I really do think that freedom comes in all shapes and sizes and or freedom comes for anybody because I, I was a drug addict. And the day that I accepted the Messiah, the day that I allowed him to come into my life and change, my drug addiction was gone completely. And I was addicted to at least five or six different drugs. So I think there's freedom. If there's freedom in that for me, I think there's freedom in this for uh, through Jesus, through Yeshua. And I think that it's important to recognize that freedom. And I'm going to be keeping in touch with Matthew. We're going to keep you guys updated on how he's been doing. And uh, just be in prayer for him. Please be in prayer for him because this is something that nobody should have to go through as a human being. This is something um, that is is so disgusting that this that people have to go through this and there's no help for him. Because I know, um, I know this, there is help through the Messiah, whether he um, dies in the, in the end, he has hope now. He has hope in the, in hope that he will have a better life after this. Hope that the people that have been doing this will come to justice and every tear will be wiped away. All these people that are doing this stuff will be brought to the light. And that is the thing they're scared of the most is being brought to the light. Um, just like every cockroach runs when the lights come on, just like every rat runs when the lights come on, when somebody approaches them, when you shine the light on them, these people will run and be scared when the light approaches them. And one day, everything comes to the light. No, no deed in secret is not brought out. Every deed that's done in secret is brought out before each one of us and brought out before the throne room of the Most High. He sees everything. These people think that they're doing this stuff in secret. They think they'll get away with it. They will not get away with it. And in fact, they're going to suffer for it. They're going to take the punishment that the fallen angels should have been taking, and they're going to be taking those, those judgments. So if you're listening right now and you're one of these people, repent right now. Repent and be done with this stuff because you're going to end. And you have repentance. Guess what? There is forgiveness. Even if you've done this thing to other people, there's forgiveness for even you. I've done horrible things in my life. You're not too evil to have forgiveness. Stop it now. Repent. Seek forgiveness uh, for all of you that are going through this. Seek the help. Uh, the Bible says that they, the, the, that the Lord is close to those who are brokenhearted, close to the downtrodden, and this is the this is what He He loves you, and He wants to do. He wants to He wants to be there with you. And I and I'll just let David and Donna talk now, but I just want you guys to realize that there's so uh, much, so much out there that is just wicked, but there's also so much light that is out there. And um, just like the Johnny Cash song, Johnny Cash song goes, sooner or later, sooner or later, he's going to uh, God's gonna shut God's him down, gonna cut you down, <laughs> cut you down. So sooner or later, he's going to cut you down, guys out there, the ones who are out there that are doing this to people. And I hope you are listening. And I hope you repent and I hope you change your ways. Well, John, I tell you what, I couldn't have said it any better than you just did. Mm -hmm. God, he is on the throne and he can protect us and he can, we have to trust him that he knows people's hearts and he is a just judge. So we thank the Lord for that opportunity that we've heard Matthew's testimony again tonight. I totally agree with John. Thank you so much, John, for having him on again. And thank you, Matthew, for sharing again. Something we always say is that there's nothing that the devil can do to someone that God can't undo. And one thing that I see and recognize in Matthew, that Matthew is someone that the Lord has his hand on. He's moving in the purpose and plan of God and doing what he's doing. And when we're in the center of God's will, that's the safest place we can be. And I want everyone that's been victimized and abused in any way to have hope. And I want Matthew to have hope because I want to, and I want, and I know that all of our now you see TV audience will agree in prayer that not only do you just survive, but that you thrive, that your health will be restored, 
that you're going to continue to move in God's will and purpose in your life and that I believe you are just now beginning to discover that big plan that God has placed you in. So I want you to have hope, Matthew, and to know that here in Evansville, Indiana, and all around the world, you've got some people praying for you. Thank you so much, uh, both Donna and David, for your such kind words and encouraging words. And I think, and John, your your little summary there, these are, uh, I mean, so encouraging and giving me hope. I, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. David, there's no, or uh, I'm sorry, Matthew, there's no coincidences. There's not even, that's, that's not even a word in the Hebrew language. Coincidence is not a word. This is a divine appointment. This is a, this is a time. Uh, you were supposed to talk to us. You're supposed to meet us. You're supposed to meet the maker. And I think that this is, this is amazing time for you. This is going to be um, something that changes your life. Not just, be, not because you met us, but because you met the King, because you realize that he is the Lord of all. He's the creator of all. He is the name above all names. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that right there will change your life. It changed my life. And I, I'm just, I'm that happy for you. Thankful for uh, David and Donna that have that sat and talked with you for several hours. I love that. That is just, that's just amazing. And um, so anyways, Shalom guys. It was a blessing to talk to you and everybody high five. <laughs> Thank you guys so much, and we will talk to you next time. We'll keep you updated on Matthew and hopefully have him back on again um, within the next few months or whenever. So be blessed, and we'll talk to you guys later.